It's nice to have some air conditioning. Kind of reminds me of the days when we used to go down to Jamaica and do missions trips for short term and you go into a church and really the ventilation system was the gap between the top of the wall and the bottom of the roof and the open door in the back and maybe sometimes you had windows. And yet, sweating quite a bit, we got through it. It's just the way it is. Well, Gary had given me a call on Saturday and he asked if I'd like to do a series during the summertime, the summer months on Thursday nights. And I said, sure, why not? Let's do it. Let's do the will of God. Let's do the work of God within our lives, right? Always seize the opportunity that's given to you. Always be prepared at any moment. Sometimes we don't always get prepared at every moment, but always be prepared. But when I thought about it, I figured, well, we're going to do the book of Esther. We're going to do the book of Esther. And tonight we're going to do Esther chapter 1, verses 1 through 22. And we're going to kind of give an introduction at first. But I titled tonight's message, To Obey or Not to Obey. That is the question. To obey or not to obey. That is the question. Kind of reminds me of... Uh, those old stories of the past, Romeo and Juliet, right? But for the overall series in the book of Esther, I call it Courage in the Crucible. Courage in the Crucible because what was going to happen in Esther? Haman, the wicked Amalekite, was going to seek to bring genocide to the Jewish people there in Susa and throughout the Persian Empire itself. And we live in those days today. Many of our brothers and sisters in the Lord are threatened with persecution, are threatened with death. We've seen it with the Coptic Christians in Egypt. We've seen it in Syria when I ISIS is taking after them. We see it in Iraq. We see it in Iran. We see it throughout history. And I don't know if you've noticed, but I've seen it in this nation. There's been a sudden change that's going on. There really is such a hatred for everything Christian and everything of God that's going on even within our government, within our politics. And there's a group of people within our, our government that just really hates God's people. And could we face the same threats in the coming years? It's possible. And what do we need? We really need the courage of God, the strength of God, the hope of God, and the power of God to live in these last days despite a people coming against us more and more. We very well could face some strong persecution in that day. So let's pray and we'll get started. Father in heaven, we believe that the day of your return is near. We don't know the day, we don't know the hour, but the signs are ever increasing and becoming more powerful before us. And Lord, we pray that in these last days you would cause us to look up because our redemption draws near. If these things are happening and coming about, our redemption also draws near. So we look forward to your return, but we pray for power, we pray for courage, we pray for faith and obedience in these last days, or that we would be found occupying until you come, doing your work, doing your will, seeking your face, drawing near to you. Though many are falling away, Lord, we don't want to. We want to have a new fire and a new passion, a new spirit, a new work of God within our lives. And that can only come about because of you, because of your work within us. And so we pray for that, Lord. Even in the messages that we're going to be talking about in the book of Esther in the coming weeks, we pray that you bring to light the things that you would have us to share, the things that you would have us to learn, the applications for our lives. And Lord, that we would just seek you in them. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Just to give some outline before we start the book of Esther, because I think it's important that we kind of give an outline, kind of give an understanding of what this book is all about, so that as we get into each one of the chapters, they'll be more applicable to us. We'll have a background, we'll have an understanding. So this is the way I teach, that's kind of my style. I like to kind of give an introduction to the book and then go right after it and get into the applications. Now regarding the author of this book, we don't know. It wasn't Esther. We don't know exactly. Uh, what we do know is that Nehemiah and Ezra didn't write the book. It's not their literary style because their emphasis was upon the Lord, the law, the temple, prayer found throughout those books. 
But here we don't have that. What we have here is an emphasis on the deliverance of the Jews and the celebration of the Feast of Purim, and it points to a Jewish writer in that. The details of the king's court and the palace in Shushan, in, or in the Greek, Susa, speaks of a person who had access to the palace. They understood the administration of the things that are going on amongst the king. So Jewish scholars predominantly think it was Mordecai, and I tend to believe that it could very well be Mordecai. We just don't know. And that's not that important. We just don't know. Who cares? But it's not Esther. The date and the place written of this book. Now, most scholars attest to the writing of this book at the end of the reign of King Ahasuerus. Now, he reigned from 486 to 465 BC, or shortly after or under the reign of King Artaxerxes I, his son, who followed him, and he reigned in Persia from 464 to 425 or 424 BC. The events of this book, they take place in Susa or Shushan. It happened to be the winter palace of the Persian Empire and the kings there. Susa was located approximately 150 miles north of the Persian Gulf, about 200 miles plus east of Babylon. And the writing of Esther likely occurred in Susa in that time or later when they had come back to Israel itself. Now, the historical background, the events of this book, when did it occur? It occurs over a 10-year span of years, somewhere between 483, 42 to 473 or 472 BC. If you're looking in the Bible and you're wondering about the chron chronological order of things, this book Esther was written between Ezra chapter 6 and Ezra chapter 7. Ezra chapter 6, as you recall, was the temple in Jerusalem was finally completed. And remember, King Darius I had sent out a decree as it finished the temple. And the prophets Haggai and Zechariah were around in that time under Ezra. And they were encouraging them to, to build the temple. Remember, Haggai, the prophet, said, hey, guys, you're building nice panel homes, but get back and build the church of God, so to speak. Build the temple, finish it, and complete it. Because they had a previous decree that said, stop. Stop building. And there was great opposition that was going on. And so the prophet Haggai was encouraging them to get back to work. And, and Zechariah was encouraging them in regards to, hey, the Lord's returning to Jerusalem. Jerusalem's the main place. Finish the work. Continue the work of God. And Ezra chapter 7, well, that was the chapter that Ezra returned to Jerusalem with a second group of exiles. The first group of exiles had come under Zerubbabel when they first came to build the, build the temple itself. And so for the period of time, chapters 1 through 6 of Ezra, well, that occurred between 538 and 516 B.C. Now, Ezra chapters 7 through 10 occurred around 458, 457 B.C., Whereas the book of Nehemiah follows the book of Esther and also follows Ezra chapter 7 through 10, that was between the years of 445 to about 425 B.C. So that kind of gives you a time frame of the events of this book of Esther. Some notable omissions in the book of Esther. This is kind of a different book than we see a lot in the Old Testament. You'll notice that God is not mentioned the Lord is not mentioned. The Holy Spirit is not mentioned in this book. We see no evidence of the captive people praying or seeking the Lord or seeking the scriptures, looking to the law for understanding or even turning to God in their desperate hour. Why is that? But fasting occurred. They had fasting on two occasions. We don't know exactly, but many Bible scholars relate this to the spiritual condition that was going on within the Persian Empire at that time. If you've been with Gary on Thursday nights as he's gone through the book of Ezra and you've read for yourself the book of Nehemiah in the past, what was happening? It was kind of like a roller coaster of faith. They were going from a time that they were seeking the Lord and serving Him and obeying Him. They were in prayer and obedience. And then all of a sudden, what's happening? They're participating in mixed marriages, 
Believers were marrying unbelievers, and it showed the condition of their hearts, and Ezra had to make that correction when he first returned back to Jerusalem. Nehemiah is going to have to do it twice. And the prophet Malachi is the one that kind of goes along and corresponds with the book of Nehemiah. And it gets to the point where the leaders are participating in sin. All things are going on. In fact, Nehemiah is about ready to go crazy and tear out their beards. In fact, I think he did it a little bit. And he's going crazy on that. He's, he's challenging the people to repent and turn back to the ways of the Lord. And Malachi got to the point in Malachi chapter 1, I wish they would just close the doors. There was such a, a deadness. There was such a, a fakeness. Even their offerings were really nothing. It didn't mean anything. They were kind of sending blemished sacrifices and things like that. So things were going on at that time. People were going back and forth. And also at this time, if, if you noticed, when Gary studied the book of Ezra, most of them had not returned from Babylon and Persia when the decree was given by Cyrus to go back and to rebuild the temple, to return. Approximately 60,000 in total returned at the time. Some people have estimated that maybe between 2 and 3 million people of Israel, the Jewish people, were residing throughout the Babylonian and and Persian Empire of the time, that's a lot of people that didn't come back. They were walking in disobedience to the Lord because even the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 48, 20, the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 10, also 50, verse 8, 51, verse 6, told them to return from Babylon. I want you to go back. And remember Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, when Daniel was praying, and he was thinking about, wow, Jeremiah had said that 70 years was the time of captivity. And they were going to be going back. So Daniel was praying and the Lord gave him a bunch of prophecy regarding the events of the last days concerning the nation of Israel, concerning the city of Jerusalem, concerning the people of God and what was to happen. So he gave him a lot. So they were, they were walking in disobedience even here at this time. Some have said, well, maybe this is just the literary style of the author of this book as to why I didn't mention those things. It's possible. I'll give that. It's possible. But I think more so when I've compared a lot of the biblical scholars, the Calvary Chapel teachers and things like that, they really relate it more to the disobedience that was going on at that time, that they were really struggling. Because they were struggling at this time before Ezra returned. They were struggling in their faith at that time before he returned. So that's what can happen within our lives as well. Sometimes, you know, we're on fire. There's a fresh work of the Spirit of God. I'm just thinking about the mid-1960s to the 1970s, the Jesus movement. There were a lot of people coming to Christ. There was, there was really a, a work and move of the Spirit, and then things kind of became more traditional. In every generation, we just need a new work of God. Every generation. In fact, I was just praying for that back there. We just, we need a new work of God. We need a new work of the Spirit that is giving us a hunger for His Word, a, a passion for the things of God, a passion for evangelism, just a passion that, that we don't have to be greatly gifted, you know. God's going to gift the ones He's called, right? He's called you. He's called me. Whatever that might be, the work of service that God has called you to do, to honor Him, to glorify Him, and to be used in these last days. Be praying for that. We just, you know, even though these are the last days and it talks about apostasy and the rebellion and the turning away from God, you know, we are the people of God. We're, we're getting the Word of God right here. And so let's use this time that we have if we even have to go to prison in a short period of years. Use the time for that passion and that fire to be renewed by God. Now, when we look at the book of Esther, some of the main purpose and the theme of Esther, well, really, it's God's sovereignty and faithfulness to his people, even in disobedience. Even though God may not be seen, but he's still in control. Why? Because he's always working behind the scenes and maybe out front directly at times in regards to all the nations of the earth. He's the one who raises up kings. He's the one who takes them down as well. God's still in control. No matter what Satan has authority over and what he's being allowed to do by the hand of God, being allowed to 
do things and bring together this coming world empire, this one religious system, all that, God's still in control. And he's still in control of the Jewish people and the nation of Israel, though even though Gary was speaking about on Sunday about this movement that denies the right of Israel to be in the land, that pretty much says that, oh, the church has overtaken, has overtaken all the prophecies of the Old Testament regarding Israel. That's just not true. God has a work with Israel, and he's doing a great work. He's bringing them together. He was moving them by the Spirit back to the land, and he's moving them by the Spirit in Aliyah back to Israel, back to Jerusalem for the last days, for this time. So even though most of the captive Jews had not returned to Israel, they were about to face a possible genocide, a possible holocaust, so to speak. They were about to be put in the crucible by that wicked Haman, the Amalekite. You remember the Amalekites? They're the ones that attacked the Israelites as they came out of Egypt and they were in the wilderness. Well, it was that group of people, the same group of people that Saul was told to take out, but he did, wasn't obedient to the Lord, and the Lord removed him. King David went after a lot of them when he was there in Ziklag, and he was fleeing from the Philistines, and hiding from, not from the Philistines, but he was hiding from Saul, and he was amongst, and found amongst the Philistines itself. The things that we can guarantee, despite what Satan is at work to destroy the Jewish people, to destroy the nation of Israel, to prevent the return of the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, despite what he's trying to do in opposition always against God, God is always going to fulfill his promises. He made promises to Abraham and the patriarchs back in, in uh, Genesis chapter 12 that he's going to be faithful to his covenant. He's going to bless those who bless Israel. He's going to curse those who curse Israel. And he will never leave nor forsake his people. And the same application is for us as well. Despite what's going on, even if we fall under persecution, even if some of us face death, the Lord will never leave us nor forsake us. We've got to remember those promises. Israel needs to remember those promises today. Even though they, many have thought about, well, why the Holocaust in World War II? We'll talk about some of those things. But the main thing, Satan really has a work against Israel. If you can prevent the return of Israel and the people of Israel and you can prevent and destroy them, what happens? Jesus would not have come the first time, right? But hey, don't worry about it. The Lord's in control. No problem there, right? So he's never going to leave nor forsake his people. But yet, if you walk in disobedience and you turn away from the Lord, what happens? It follows, disobedience often follows unbelief, the forgetting of God. Then what happens? Discipline, correction, threats of danger often follow those things often follow that disobedience. And this has been the history of Israel and the Jewish people from their beginning, yet God has always kept his promise. He's always delivered them, and he's always saved a remnant, and he's always revived them. The things that are coming in the battle of Ezekiel 38 and 39, it's, it's already a, a fulfillment of a promise that he already given to him. He said, I'm returning you to the land not because of your righteous works, the righteous things you've done. I'm returning to you to the land. I'm combining uh, the stick of Judah and the stick of Israel or Ephraim. I'm combining them together and returning to the land because of my name's sake, not because of your righteousness. And what's happened? Just as prophesied, they've been put back into the land. They've prospered in the land. In fact, the, the fruit of the land has grown significantly, just as prophesied. And what's happening right now? There's a formation of an alliance between Russia, Turkey, Iran, Libya, and various other nations of Arab peoples that are ready to come against the nation of Israel and the hook into the jaw, which is most likely the oil and the energy that's been discovered there in the Mediterranean Sea in regards to the natural gas and into the oil itself up there in the Golan Heights and around the Dead Sea. Russia is looking about oil. They're talking about oil. That very well could be a hook in the jaw that sends them there. But yet, after that, what are they going to find out? The world is going to know that the Lord is God. 
The world is going to know it. They're going to wake up. There's going to be a spiritual renewal with the nation of Israel at that time. So there is great hope. But yet God in the midst of this, he's completely in control of the situation. We don't have to fear. We don't have to worry. Let's just keep doing the will of God and let's get into the book of Esther. Verses 1 through 4. Here we have the feast of the leaders. Verse 1 says, Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, this was the Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, that in the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all his officials and servants, the powers of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days, 180 days in all. So here we have this first feast that was going on. And you're going to see that throughout the book of Esther. They're talking about feasts a lot. The, the gathering together, you know, the showing of the, the glory of the kingdom of itself. It was common. Rome did it quite a bit, too, when they conquered nations. They had a huge parade, and they showed off their captives and all the wares and all the goods that they had stolen and taken in and captive of all those things. But that was common amongst the empires of that time. Hey, man. Show your strength. Show who you are. So th this is a feast amongst, first of all, the leaders. And of course, we like feasts too. We like to have a good barbecue, gather together as believers, and have some good food and some good fellowship. Well, there's more than that here, and this, we'll see that in a moment. So this is what we see going on. So in this book, Esther itself, this happens to be the second book that a woman is, has a title to. Ruth, of course, was the first book, the Moabitess. Now, Esther's name, Persian, it means star. And she happens to be the main character of this book, along with Mordecai, the Jew, King Ahasuerus of Persia, and Haman, that wicked Amalekite, which I will call Hain Man, because he's going to be hung on the very gallows that he builds for Mordecai. And we're going to see in, he, in chapter 2 of Esther that Esther's Hebrew name was Hadassah, meaning myrtle, and she happened to be an orphan raised by Mordecai, brought to power. The Lord was at work. He, he raised her up for such a time as this, as we'll see later in the book of Esther. So he used her at this time. He used Mordecai at this time, and now this king Ahasuerus, he happened to succeed King Darius' father, and of course you remember King Darius, he was Ezra chapter 6, who issued decree, even was spoken of in the book of Daniel. Artaxerxes I followed him. Now some Bible translations use the name Xerxes instead of Ahasuerus, which happens to be the Greek transliteration of his Persian name, which I will not even try to pronounce at this time because I will mess it up severely. Now, Ahasuerus might be a variant of his Persian name. It was in the Hebrew text, but more likely, as most Bible scholars talk about, that it's probably a title for like Caesar or Pharaoh. Either way, what does it mean, his name? I will be silent and poor. How would you like that for your name? I will be silent and poor, like a prophecy for yourself. Oh. Now, it's stated here that he ruled over 127 provinces, extending from India to Ethiopia, a vast empire, huge empire. Now, some of those modern nations that we would know today that they had occupied, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan. Can you believe it? Someone actually occupied Afghanistan and subdued it. Those wild uh, tribes of Afghanistan, Pakistan, to the border of India, Turkey, modern-day Jordan, Israel, Syria, Lebanon, and parts of Egypt and Libya and Ethiopia and Sudan, Ethiopia and Sudan on the eastern coast of Africa, and also parts of Saudi Arabia that we would know today that they called Arabia back then. Now, Shushan, the Greek Susa, happened to be the capital, the ancient capital of Elam. When you look at 
the books of Isaiah and the books of Jeremiah when it speaks about the prophecies of Elam and the Elamites. It, this is what they're speaking about, this particular place. This was the place that Daniel had one of his visions in Daniel chapter 8. Nehemiah that we'll see later in Nehemiah chapter 1. Well, he was the cupbearer under King Artaxerxes in Nehemiah chapter 1. So a lot of background there. And there's a lot of background in this first chapter, so bear with me. But it says here, in the third year of his reign, so 483, 482 B.C., he held a feast. It was paid by the treasury. It's kind of like a major, major state dinner at the White House but with much more glory shown, much more power and wealth shown. And he invited all the leaders of the 127 provinces. And so not only did they have a feast at the beginning, but for 180 days he's displayed all this glory, this wealth. Kind of reminds me that pride goes before a fall. And we'll see that in a moment. Now, secular history at this time, mostly by the Greeks, Herodotus, they were talking about in this time, during this 180 days, he was actually planning for an invasion of Greece at that time. And it was in 481 B.C. in revenge for his father's previous defeat, that's King Darius, at Marathon near Athens. He was victorious at Thermopylae, but yet he was humbled and he was defeated later in a huge battle in 480 at Salamis, and then later in 479 at Plataea. So that pride, all that showing of all that glory during this time, he had one victory, but he also had two major defeats. And that was common amongst the kings. They were always showing off, always saying, man, hey, look at my kingdom. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? Look at what I've done. Look at this great kingdom of Babylon. And what happened? What happened to him? Well, he kind of became like one of the cattle out in the field. Kind of there <clears throat> fellowshipping with the dew on the grass in the morning for a period of time until he was humbled. And he realized, hey, the Lord is God. This is the one and true God. And he was restored back to his kingdom. But for a period of time, because of his pride, and it was common for the empires and the kings of that time to have great pride, and the Lord often put him to humility. Now let's look at verses 5 through 8. Now this happens to be the people's feast. So you had the feast of the nobles. Now you have the feast of the people. Verse 5 says, And when these days were completed, so the 180 days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all the people who were present in Shushan, the citadel, from great to small in the court of the garden of the king's palace. So, I mean, he had a pretty serious courtyard in the garden of the king's palace for all these people from smallest to greatest. And then it kind of goes on and explains a lot of their wealth, a lot of the power that was there. You know, the Persian Empire had a lot of riches. So did the Babylonian Empire and the Greeks and the Romans after that. But it says here, there were white and blue linen, really representing the royal colors of Persia. Curtains fastened with cords of fine linen. So you had fine linen and purple on silver rods, like curtain rods, and marble pillars. And the couches were of gold and silver that they reclined on on a mosaic pavement of alabaster, turquoise, and white, and black marble. So speaking about the floor of the garden itself, the courtyard. And they served drinks in golden vessels. Not golden vessels, but golden vessels. Kind of reminds me, we are here looking for the nuclear vessels? <laughs> Star Trek, remember that? When they were trying to save the whales? Okay. Live long and prosper. Okay. Each vessel being different from the other with power or with royal wine. So this wasn't the cheap wine. This was the royal wine of the kingdom in abundance according to the generosity of the king. Oh, king, you're so generous. Thank you so much for this great feast in wine. Verse 8, in accordance with the law, that would be the Persian law, 
not the Old Testament Mosaic law. In accordance with the law, the drinking was not compulsory, so the king had ordered all the officers of the household that they should do according to each man's pleasure. So what was going on here? A second feast that was going on, lasting seven days. The courtyard was decked out in glory. It was a fine display. It was a fine event. Everyone was dressed properly. Everyone had all the riches and the glory that they got to celebrate with and much food and wine to drink. Now, Persian custom required that in that day at a feast, when the king or the leader of the, of the feast that was going on, when he raised his cup, everyone drank. So you had any time he raised his cup to give a toast, you drank along with them. But it so happens that this particular time that he made a law, he made an exception, allowing anyone to drink as much as he wanted or as little as he wanted. And we're going to see the result of that here in a moment. Now, Esther 1.9 says, Queen Vashti also made a feast for the woman in the royal palace, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. Now we're introduced to Queen Vashti, really the queen of the harem, because in that day, kings had a harem. They had a huge number of concubine and extra wives that they used for their own pleasure. Since there's someone young here, I won't go into any great detail on that. But her name means beautiful, and it says that she was a beautiful woman. Now, her Greek name was possibly Amistris, according to the Greek historians itself. So that's kind of an introduction to Queen Vashti. We're going to see her deposition, or really her being deposed from the throne itself here in a few verses. But let's look at verses 10 through 12. Here she disobeys the king. Verse 10 says, on the seventh day, so she had a separate feast for the woman. It was common in those days to where the women were separate from the men. They've oftentimes feasted separately from the men. Now it's going to be a different story, as we'll see later in the book of Esther, that she actually had a feast and invited the king and Haman along with her. So that wasn't always the case, but it was common in that time to separate the men and women at that time. So here on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, man, he was cheerfully drunk, so to speak, he commanded Mahuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus. What, for what reason? To bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing her royal crown, in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials. So he's drunk at this time, making his command, for she was beautiful to behold. So not only was Queen Esther, we'll see later, was very beautiful, but even Queen Vashti was very beautiful to behold. But it says here in verse 12, but Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, brought by his eunuchs. Therefore the king was furious and his anger burned within him. And the anger of the kings, the anger of the emperors of those days was common. And the anger came about because of disobedience oftentimes. It also came about, remember in Daniel's day with Nebuchadnezzar, he was angry at the wise men, the wise guys. The wise men, the astrologers, they couldn't interpret his dreams. They, they were furious. He was quick to anger. And we're going to see his anger pronounced throughout. And some basic, before I get into some of the details here, it kind of reminds me the anger. Sometimes, men, we, we struggle with anger because we don't get the respect that we're looking for. See, to a man, ladies, to a man, what's important is that his wife submit to him and respect him. It's very important to him. It's, it's just the way it is. It's kind of the way we're built. We're called to lead we're called to be respected. And Paul writes about that in Ephesians chapter 5. And he, he's given instruction. The thing that men have most difficulty with is loving their wives. So we're called to love our wives. Husband, love your wives. The thing that 
some women have most difficulty with is submitting to or respecting their husbands for various things. And so here we have a situation where Queen Vashti refuses the king's order. Now, in that day, you didn't refuse the king's order. You were in trouble if you disobeyed the king's order. Now, go out into the streets and the riots in the streets and the riots against President Trump. You know, that Berkeley, they're practically burning down the building and threatening people, walking in disobedience. They're having to pretty much cancel events because there's such a, a violence against him wherever he goes. But he's the president of the United States. Did they do that under President Obama? No, they didn't, they didn't do that. But here we in this situation, he's furious because she disobeyed the command. So he was merry with wine. He was cheerfully drunk. He commanded his seven eunuchs. Of course, if you were a eunuch at that time and you were administrating the harem of the concubines of the kings, you were castrated so that you would not mess around with the concubines of the king and produce a seed that wasn't the king's, wasn't his successor. So he commanded them to have her come before him and to present, hey, parade your beauty. You know, parade your beauty before us all. She refused to obey. We're not told exactly why she refused to obey, but possibly it's because the custom of that day that separated men and women required women to be covered in the presence of men. The veiling of women that you often see amongst Muslim nations today. It was common in the Middle East at that time, not only to have that separation, but the, the women's were to be presented as chaste. If they weren't, then they you were usually prostitutes in that time. So the veiling, so possibly, we don't know exactly, perhaps she responded to his drunkenness. Hey, you're just a drunken fool. I'm not listening to you. Maybe they had marital issues going on at the time. They were just fighting one another because... If you realize and you're maybe you're a young person, you're about to be married and maybe it's, it's the honeymoon season and, and you're doing your best during the dating time and you're, you're thinking about it and you're, you're realizing it's like, man, if I show my bad side, he isn't going to love me. Or if I show my bad side, she isn't going to love me. We're not going to get married or anything like that. So you do everything you can to make yourself look good and appearance and, and then you get married and bam, what happens? reality comes in, right? Now, I'm a single guy, so I can't speak from great experience. I just watch you guys. I watch married couples, and I observe what's, what's going on. So if you're going into marriage, and you're thinking, it's like, this is going to be great. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be romantic. You know, he's romantic to me now. It's, you know, it's going to last a lifetime. You know, this romance novel and all this stuff. And it, it went, what? It doesn't happen, does it? In fact, you kind of grow apart, and you kind of have to go back. This is kind of like a marriage tune-up, right? We all need a marriage tune-up. Well, I don't right now because I'm not married. I'm married to the Lord, so to speak. But you all need that marriage tune-up every once in a while. So we don't know exactly why, but either way, she disobeyed a direct order from the king in front of his guests, in front of all those leaders of the provinces. Wait a minute. If you can't command control of your own wife, how are you going to command control of this kingdom and go and fight Greece that you're planning about and taking a war to, to the Greeks? Man, what kind of presentation would that be? It wouldn't look good for the king. He wouldn't have much respect from his servants and the ones who were called as military officials to go and follow him, would he? This is the same king who, in his anger, according to secular history, there was a bridge built over this ocean. And the ocean waves rose up and destroyed this bridge. And what did he do? He got so mad, he killed all the people who designed and built it. And then he told them, he ordered his officials, now go whip with a whip the waves of the ocean to punish them. Kind of an irrational kind of guy. Discipline the ocean waves with a whip. And when we're talking about marriage, you know, when we're talking about that dating season, so to speak, for maybe those on YouTube or those uh, uh, listening live on live stream or something like that, think about it. When you're dating, if the guy that you're dating, girls, if he's full of anger and rage during the dating time, think about what he's going to be in marriage if things have not been worked out. Don't continue dating a guy like that. 
If he's angry now and he's giving you a hard time now and he's full of rage, get away from that guy. Maybe you get married later if the Lord does the work and changes them. And the same thing for, for guys. If, if your future wife is always disrespecting you and she's always fighting you, maybe it's a good idea to kind of hold off for a little while. Let God work. Let the Holy Spirit work. Because if you're in that situation and the man happens to be violent, what's he going to do when the marriage gets tough? He may hit you. He may beat you. He may bring violence against you. You don't want that. I had to work with a couple in Long Island, New York, that the verbal abuse was almost becoming physical abuse. And we talked about separation for a season. They chose divorce but yet later they reconciled, good thing, by the grace of God. But think about those things when you're entering marriage. Anger is, is something that uh, can really be explosive and very difficult. And maybe some of you have gone through that within your lives and you've had to come and seek the Lord and, and he's, by his grace, he's ministered to you and showed you his grace and his love. And he's brought healing and restoration in that. Now we go into crisis management here Verse 13, it says, Then the king said to the wise men who understood the times, for this was the king's manner toward all who knew law and justice, those closest to him being Karshina, Shethar, Edmatha, Tarshish, Maris, Marcina, and Mamukin, the seven princes of Persia. So these were different from the seven eunuchs. These were the seven princes of Persia and Media who had access to the king's presence and who ranked highest in the kingdom. What shall we do to Queen Vashti? So this is King Ahasuerus asking, what shall we do with Queen Vashti according to law because she did not obey the command of King Ahasuerus brought to her by the eunuch? So kind of imagine president getting his cabinet together. It's crisis management time. What are we going to do? She, she disobeyed the king. How, how is it going to affect us? What's going to happen? And who were these people? These were his advisors. These were the ones who knew about the Persian law and the justice system and what to do. They were like Daniel. They gave advice to the king. They were kind of like his closest cabinet members. But also in the book of Daniel, they also happened to be astrologers and magicians who gave advice, who interpreted dreams and predicted the future. Oftentimes they were wrong, except for Daniel who predicted it right on and got the visions right. So that's what was going on. It was, it was a time of crisis management. What are we going to do? This is a disaster. News at 11. Scandal in the White House. Man, what, what are we going to do? She disobeyed. Now, it says here in verse 16 through 20, it says, And Mamukin answered before the king and princes. So one of the seven princes stood up. He was the main guy. Queen Vashti has not only wronged the king, but also all the princes and all the people who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. So he's extending it further. Not only does it affect you, king, and your wife, and your marriage, but man, it affects the whole kingdom, all the provinces, and, and all us guys. Her disobedience affects all us guys. Verse 17, for the queen's behavior will become known to all women. Here comes the scandal. So that they will despise their husbands in their eyes. When they report, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought in before him, but she did not come. This very day, the noble ladies of Persia and Medea will say to all the kings, or Media, will say to all the king's officials that they have heard of the behavior of the queen. Thus, there will be excessive content or excessive despising and wrath. The scandal that's going to come. Oh, my God. If it pleases the king, let's do this. Let a royal decree go out from him and let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it will not be altered. So the law can't be altered. The decree can't be altered. That Vashti shall come no more before the king Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. When the king's decree, which he will make, is proclaimed throughout all his empire, for it is great. Hey, remember, king, your, your empire is great. When that happens, all wives, this is what's going to happen. This is the end result that's going to happen. All wives will honor their husbands, both great and small. Really? Do you think that will happen? 
Dream on. I've got more for you. I've got real estate for you in a special place. It costs you a lot of money. But no, no, that, that's not going to happen. So here was the response of the wise guys. All the wise guys. Remember the three stooges. Hey, Cain, man, you messed up with your presidential tweets. The men of the empire will no longer be the king of nothing. Do you remember that series way back then about Ralph and the honeymooners and all that stuff? About honeymooners. You'll be the king of nothing. And the women are going to rebel throughout the palace and the provinces. There's going to be great chaos and disorder in the kingdom. Therefore, if it pleases the king, this is what we need to do. Queen Vashti will no longer be allowed in the presence of the king. Well, she didn't want to come into the presence of the king. Well, she's no longer going to come in the presence of the king. We're going to give her a royal position to another. Basically, she's going to be deposed of being queen, and she's going to be divorced. Hey, find another wife. And number three, but make this law irre irrevocable according to Persian custom, so that cannot be overturned. If you do this, wives will honor their husbands, guaranteed. Can you really make a law and make people do it? You can kind of do that for fear. You can kind of make some things happen if you bring a lot of fear behind it. But in reality, in, in terms of the things of God, guys, can we really make our wives obey us because we have a law behind it? No, not going to happen. Your wives will let you know. Verses 21 through 22 says, And the reply pleased the king, and the princes and the king did according to the word of Mamukin. Then he sent letters to all the king's provinces, to each province in its own script, and to every people in their own language, that each man should be master of his own house. Yep, you're going to be master of your own house, and you're going to speak in the language of his own people. Wow. Wow, that's awesome. So the king liked the idea in his drunken stupor. Send out the Pony Express. Get the message out. Get the fast horses and the chariots out. Get the message out. Send it out. Deliver the edict. And men are going to be the master of his house, and his native language will be spoken in the home. And that's going to be a sign of his authority. Wow. That really proves it, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It speaks a lot about obedience here today. That's real kind of like the theme, to obey or not to obey. So now how do we apply it to our own lives? So let's take a look at some of the scriptures here and apply it to our own lives in regards to obedience. Well, what did Jesus say about some of these things? I'm going to turn to Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28. And if you recall, this was the time when uh, the mother of Zebedee's sons, James and John, said, come up to Jesus and say, hey, you know, can you set aside in your kingdom positions of power, one on your right, one on the left for my sons? And of course, the response that Jesus said, hey, you don't know what you're asking for. This is not for me to grant, but this is to be granted by my father. And of course, all the other disciples got mad at him, kind of looked at him with, with fury. He's like, who made you guys king? What are you talking about? But then he goes on, here in verse 25, it says, So he said to them, this is Jesus speaking, you will, actually, I'm thinking verse 23, and it's not there. So he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism I'm to be baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it's for those who it is prepared by my Father. And then verse 25 says, But Jesus called to them, called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. So we just saw the pattern of the Gentile rulership. Issue a decree. Issue a demand. Make it happen. Force it to happen. Otherwise, there's penalty. Fighting for position. Jockeying for position. And, of course, there's going to be that jockeying for position with Haman, you know, seeking authority under the king as we go into the book of Esther. But the Lord responds... He says, yet it shall not be so among you. That's the way the world works in the workplace, in government positions. Everyone's jockeying for position. They're stepping over one another. They're trashing one another to get to the top, reach the glass ceiling, all this stuff. No respect, but not so with us in the kingdom of God, in the church, amongst believers. But it says, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Whoa, that's backwards. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
So Jesus set the example of servant leadership that a guy is to have, the leaders in the church are to have itself, serve the people. Lay down your life for them. Don't be like the Gentiles. Don't be fighting for position. Don't be doing what they do. But if you really want to be first in the kingdom of God, you're going to have to be last. You know, start at the bottom. Serve the people. Learn from there. Learn to grow in faithfulness step by step. Completely different. So there's an obedience that we have, but it's matched with a level of service that we're to have. Now I'm going to turn to Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 18. Now we get some examples about obedience in marriage and family. What are some applications to us here? Verse 18, wives, submit to your own husbands, and note what it says, as is fitting to the Lord. You're not called to obey your husband who is calling you to disobey God. Ultimately, we obey God first, right? We serve God first, but the thing that he's telling women, just as Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 5, another good marriage tune-up for you to look at, Submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. But then he goes on and gives the man the greater role. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Was King Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus, was he nice to his queen? No, he was furious. He was angry. And so men have got to be careful. We can easily be bitter towards our wives when they don't obey us and submit to us. Maybe... The reason why that, they're not feeling secure in the home because they don't sense the love that we have for them, that servant leadership kind of love. So the husband has a greater role to be like that of Christ, laying down his life. And then it goes on, it talks about children. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Now, in the Old Testament, child didn't obey. They got taken out in the Old Testament right? But now he gives instruction here. Obey your parents in all things because the Lord's put them over you. He's he's there to teach you and to train you in the ways of the Lord. But then it goes on and says this, and this is something that we can learn as well. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. So as a father, we have the responsibility. The children are to obey us But as a father, we have the responsibility that we don't embitter them, that we don't provoke them to wrath, as it talks about in other scriptures and other translations. That in our anger and our demanding, we can actually provoke children to wrath, to disobey, and suffer the consequences of that because of our own actions. So these are some kind of quick marriage and family tune-ups. I'm reminded in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 2 says, Remind them, now speaking of rulers, the authorities in the government, the authorities in society that we're under in all cases, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. So even in our obedience, we have a responsibility obedience to authority, as long, remember Peter spoke about it, am I to obey God or am I to obey man? When he was challenged in the book of Acts, he says, you can no longer preach in Jesus' name. When they're telling you here in the United States, you can't pray in the name of Jesus. You can't preach in the name of Jesus. You can't share the gospel in the workplace. You have to be tolerant and diversified like the rest of us, like they're tolerant. And they say, you can't do that? You're going to say, respectfully, in humility, am I going to obey you or am I going to obey the Lord? And you may lose your job because of it, the reality. But will you stand for the Lord and for the gospel of Jesus Christ in all their garbage that they put out there? But yet, do we have that kind of respect going on in the streets against the current, with the current president to speak evil of no one? Wow. Isn't that convicting? To be peaceable, gentle. Are are you seeing that with the guys with the black masks on and the people that are really the anarchists that are stirring up the crowds? Is, Is that happening? Is that gentleness? I don't expect the world to get it, 
but I do expect us. This is the way we're to act, to be an example to society. Then Hebrews 13, verse 17, speaking of church leaders, obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Wow, you want to be a pastor? You're going to have a greater accountability and a greater judgment from the Lord if you don't obey what he tells you to do. We have a responsibility to watch out for your souls, to bring you the message of the truth, not to give you lies or what you want to hear, or your itching ears want to hear, because we have to give account to God. But it says, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So it, if, if a person's rising up against a leader in the church, that's not going to be, a, not going to be profitable, right? It's not going to be profitable for you. So some examples. When we look at the example of Queen Vashti, she really should have obeyed the king in that because of the times that was there. But we don't know exactly behind the scenes exactly why she was disobedient. There was a way probably to approach it in humility and in, and in gentleness. But the king had the responsibility. He was a drunken fool. And maybe he asked her to do something that just wasn't right. That's when, is it, is it causing you to disobey God? And sometimes you submit and you just, hey, let the Lord work. Let the Lord work. Let the Lord change that person. And so it's a reminder to us. Just to, there's going to be a lot more application. We just had a lot of uh, behind the scenes kind of things to kind of give us an appetite for what is coming. But maybe the, some of these things are going on within our lives. Maybe we're struggling in our family relationships right now. Maybe we're struggling in, in the workplace and we're wondering, should we really obey in this situation? Well, it's just a time, maybe just we can just pray right now as we're ending the service and Pastor Dave's gonna come up and sing one last song or maybe you need some prayer afterwards. And just use this time. Let's just bring it before the Lord. Maybe we're struggling with anger in a situation because of the things that are going on within our lives at this time. There's just a lot of things going on. Let's just seek it. Let's just seek the Lord and just bring it by the Holy Spirit and see what he wants to do. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for tonight, for your grace, for your mercy, for your love, for the word of God and the things that you have spoken to us. And we had to get through them quickly. Lord, we'll emphasize more of them in the coming weeks. But even now, Lord, you know the hearts of your people and what we need for tonight and where we're at right now. And so for those that are struggling in these areas that we talked about, that we mentioned, Lord, first show them your grace and your mercy and your love for them, your forgiveness for them, but also begin to do that work that you have for them. And, and in this situation, give them confidence that you're at work, that you're in control, that you're working things out to the end that you want to accomplish. And just go step by step within their lives, Lord, within all of our lives, Bring us to a place of obedience, that obedience that comes from faith that we talked about when we studied the book of Jonah, the obedience that comes from faith. 